'cause your mama said so. Be nice, even when she says no. Be nice when grandma's driving too slow. Let's be. That song. So we used to play that song for our kids when they were really little. That would be on the playlist in our car.、Uh, and I tried to do the math on the way to church this morning as to how many times I've heard that song. And I was like, okay, three kids. I'm 40 years old. Carry the one. I think I've heard that song a billion times in my life. Because when our kids were little, we so badly just wanted them to be nice. We would tell them, "Be nice." Like when we would drop them off at their friend's house, or we drop them off at their grandparents' house, we would say, "Hey, be nice." And then they got older, and we still tell them to be nice, but the way we say it's a little different now. Now it's mostly like, "Hey, be nice!" Like we we shouted at them, which is kind of contradictory,、um, but we say "be nice" a lot in our family. It's not just the kids. I'm married,、um, and many times my wife will tell me, "Be nice." We just got through a crazy month of a lot of baseball. Our kids played、uh, like 16 games in 10 straight days, and I would make comments about umpires <laughs> or other drivers. I would question their visual capabilities or whether anyone's ever driven a car ever. <laughs> Uh, and my wife would look at me and say, "Jonathan," which is how I know she's serious. She'd say, "Be nice." I'd say, "Okay, I'll do that." <laughs> In preparation for this morning,、uh, so I asked my kids, "Hey, how many times do you think the Bible tells us to be nice?" And Sam was like, "Oh, it's got to be like four thousand." And Molly said, "No, it's way, way more than that." And what's interesting, if you look in the Bible. God never tells us to be nice, not once. It's not in there. He calls us to something much different. He calls us to something much better to be, than being nice. He calls us to be kind. And in this world, I think we need more kindness. Would you agree? Raise your hand if you think this world needs more kindness. I don't think people are actively being mean. Where we can just walk around and go, "Hey, be nice,"、um, but I wouldn't necessarily describe the world as kind. Last week, I asked、uh, some people on our staff and some other people, "Hey, what do you think the opposite of kindness is?" Because when we talk about being nice, the opposite of nice is being mean. But what's the opposite of kindness? And these were some of the words they gave me: harsh, hostile, judgmental, indifferent. Uh, that, that sounds exactly like the kind of world we're living in today, and so I'm excited as we open up the Bible to look at what it says about kindness, because I personally need to know what kindness looks like in 2023. Because I grew up in the 90s, and in the 90s there was a very clear definition of what kindness was. How many of you have ever been to Blockbuster? All right, let's do a test. Be kind. Rewind. In the '90s, the definition of kindness was to rewind a videotape. That was it. You walk into Blockbuster, you're faced with a poster. Be kind. Rewind. At the video return, it said, "Be kind. Rewind." You open up the tape. There's a sticker. Be kind. Rewind. And God forbid you didn't rewind, they would charge you more than the tape itself. In the 90s, it was really easy to define kindness, but that begs the question: Is there any need for kindness now that there's no more blockbusters? I think there is. Well, my name is John Schofield, and I'm one of the pastors here at New Life, and I'm excited because we're in this series called Thrive, where we're looking at what Paul writes in Galatians about the fruit of the Spirit. Let's review.、Uh, Galatians chapter five, verses 22 through 23 says this. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives: love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
The Holy Spirit produces this in us. In us. It's not the fruit of the person, it's the fruit of the Spirit. This isn't something that we manifest on our own. This is something when we are following Jesus and submitting our lives to the Holy Spirit, this is what God does in us and through us. It's not our job to produce this kind of fruit in our lives. It's our jobs to love God and follow Jesus and live the kind of lives where he can do this work in us. So as we're looking to love God and follow Jesus, what does that look like? Like, what does it look like to live a kind of life of biblical kindness so the Holy Spirit can do this in us? To not just go through life not being mean, but to actually walk in biblical kindness. Because like we said, we're seeing a lot of harshness and critical We're seeing a lot of indifference to what's going on, and what we're going to see as we open God's Word today is that's not really being kind. And like I said, I don't think people are inherently mean. Like, I don't think people are going out and trying to be evil in this world. But I think there's the temptation to just kind of go with the flow, do the status quo, and sometimes we can fall into the trap of engaging with a harsh and critical world by being harsh and critical ourselves. And if we try to go out and just act like the rest of the world and go with the status quo, that's not going to help the problem. That's like being in a boat with a leak in it and being like, man, we got to get rid of this water. I know what I'll do. I'll drill holes in the bottom and let all the water out. We're just making the problem worse. Kindness is important. So as we open the Bible today, there are three questions I want to tackle. One, Why should we be kind? Two, what does kindness look like? And three, who should we be kind to? So let's start. Why should we be kind? Why does it matter? Why is it important how you and I treat other people? If God is sovereign, if God is over everything, why does it matter how we treat others? We've got to get this right because if we don't, our kindness could be fleeting. It could be temporary. It could be based on external factors in our world, like how people treat us, what kind of day we're having. We could fall into the trap of being kind to earn something from someone, like, I'm going to be nice to you because I want this thing, but if you don't reciprocate, then I'm going to turn it off. And if my ability to be kind or your ability to be kind is dependent on external factors, it's never going to last. If my kindness toward you is dependent on the kind of day I'm having, or what the stock market's doing, or how your favorite baseball team is doing, we're in trouble. If my kindness to you is dependent on the Mets, y'all better run. It is not pretty. But the good news is we have a better source for our kindness. We have a better way to thrive in the way that we treat people. Because we're kind, because we've experienced the kindness of God. This is a common theme in this entire series. If you've been here over the last few weeks through our Thrive series, you know we can, we can bear this kind of fruit in our lives because God has first shown it to us. I think Pastor Jordan said it best last week when she described it this way. Spiritual character overflows when we're filled with God's love. It's not us, it's him in us. And the same is true for kindness. Once we've experienced the kindness of God, once we've truly tasted and seen the kindness of the Lord, then we're able to be kind. And that's true of all of the fruit of the Spirit, but what I want to dig in today is is kindness specifically. So if you've brought your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open it. If you don't, take out a smartphone or a tablet and log on to the YouVersion Bible app because I really want to explore some scripture today about what God says about kindness. So as you know, the main verse for this series is Paul's letter to the Galatians. But about 15 years after that, he wrote to a co-worker of his named Titus, and this is what he writes in Titus chapter 3. We, once we too were foolish and disobedient. So he's writing to Titus. Uh, they're, they're teaching people who aren't yet followers of Jesus Christ. And he says, once too we were that way. All of us, until we were saved, we too were once foolish and disobedient. 
We were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy, and envy, and we hated each other. But when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and new life. Great name for a church. New life through the Holy Spirit. When God reveals his kindness to us, that changes everything. The word kindness, when Paul wrote this, uh, it's the Greek word Christotes. And that word is used a lot in scripture in many, many chapters and verses and books of the Bible. And in this uh, particular instance, when it's used in the Bible, Christotes describes a way of treating people that is loving and gentle and good and it avoids harshness. That's the definition of kindness in the Bible, and that's the description of God's kindness for you. When we understand that's how God's kind to us, when we understand that's the source of our kindness, then we can pour it out to others. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've been saved by the blood of Jesus, if you've accepted that gift, then this verse is for you. Because kindness isn't something we muster up on our own. It's not something we can manifest. We don't, we don't have an out where we can say, I'm just not a kind person. I just don't have the spiritual gift of kindness. It's like, that's just not my personality type. No, we don't get to say things like that because we've experienced the kindness of God. That is our source. For many of us, we just need to remember that our kindness isn't dependent on the world. It's not dependent on who's in office. It's not dependent on how we're wired. Maybe today, we just need to remind ourselves of where our kindness comes from. So for all of you who raised your hand and you remember Blockbuster, we're going to do a little brain rewiring right now. Instead of be kind, rewind... Ready? We're going to be kind, remind. Huh? You're going to remember that for the rest of your life, I promise you. <laughs> be kind, remind yourself of the kindness of God. I can't promise you that's not the cheesiest thing I'm going to say today, uh, so, so stay tuned. On those days where you find it hard to be kind, on those days where everything in your life seems to be falling apart, on those days where you hear the same song over and over and over again, and everybody who volunteered in VBS said, Amen. <laughs> On those days, we need to remind ourselves of the kindness of the Lord. We need to remember what Paul, write to, what Paul wrote to Titus where, he, Titus, where he said, When we understand God's kindness through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be kind to other people. And when Paul wrote that to Titus, he said kindness and love. And when those two words are put together, it's Christotes, and the other Greek word is philanthropia. It's where we get our word philanthropy from. And it's basically the same thing as Christotes with one difference. Philanthropia is kindness in action. Philanthropia is once we receive the kindness of the Lord, we go out and we do something. Which leads to the second question, what does kindness mean? look like once we've understood once we've received the kindness of the lord what does it look like as an action verb well there's two parts to this and the first one is this kindness is proactive and not reactive there's the temptation to think that kindness is a reactive thing where we go through life and as situations present themselves to us we can either be kind or not kind where we can walk through life like, I'm just going to, I'm going to be me. And as the opportunity presents itself, I might take it to be kind, or I might just let someone else do it. The kindness that God calls us to is proactive. It seeks out opportunities to actively be kind to other people. God's never going to make you be kind. There's never going to be a situation where you're just pre-wired and you just go out and you're a robot. God's gonna, never going to make you be kind, just like he's never going to make you serve or make you give or make you join a small group. But we're able to do these things because we've experienced his love. But if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ that are taking steps 
to walk with him, we have a part to play. And the same thing is true of kindness. Look what Paul wrote uh, to the Colossians in chapter 3. Therefore, as God's chosen people, you and I, who are followers of Jesus Christ, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Anytime you see the words clothe yourselves or put on, it's used a few times in the Bible. Anytime you see those words, that, that denotes that we have a part to play. If you've read in the Bible, put on the armor of God, put on the new self, clothe yourself with these things, that is an action verb, meaning we have a part to play. Now, make no mistake, our kindness can't save the world. Only Jesus can do that. But our kindness, how we are kind, can reveal the kindness of a loving father to a broken world. I think sometimes we can fall into the trap of thinking that it's our job to lift a broken world up to the Lord. Like we've got we, to do all these things to try to lift a broken world to the Lord. It's like, no, no, no. When we're kind, when we can show this kind of kindness to other people, we can bring heaven to a broken world. Our kindness is meant to do so much more than lift the world up. It's meant to bring heaven down. The second thing kindness looks like, in addition to being proactive and not reactive, kindness is the continued pursuit of God. Once we've tasted it, we should want more of it. Remember, this isn't something that we manifest in our own power. So we need to continually be seeking a deeper walk with Jesus Christ. If we've tasted the kindness of the Lord, we should be wanting more of it. Look what Peter writes uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2. Like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Other translations, in, uh, instead, of, instead of long, they say crave. Are you craving the kindness? Are you craving more of the Lord as a result of his kindness? Peter's writing to an audience of people who are dispersed over many, many regions who are experiencing persecutions and hardships and challenges. And he's saying, just like a newborn baby craves milk when they're young, that's how we should be craving a deeper walk with Jesus Christ any day, every day. Anyone with a baby or who's had a baby knows you don't have to remind them to eat. You don't have to wake up a baby at 2 a.m. and be like, it's time for your body. Like, you will know when a baby is hungry, right? Same is true for teenagers. I don't need to remind my 13-year-old to eat. He's always eating. They will tell you, I'm hungry. I need sustenance. I'm starving. Give me more of this. And Peter's saying, if you've really tasted the kindness of the Lord, we should be craving more of that every day. Are you craving more of his word, more of his presence, more of longing to know, God, what is your next step for me in this stage of my life? And finally, once we've done that, if we're proactively being kind, if we're, if we're craving the word more, who should we be kind to? Now that we've gotten a taste, sorry, my Italian is coming out. Now that we've gotten a taste, who is our target audience? Well, the obvious answer is be kind to everyone, right? Shocker. But especially those who are difficult. Let's face it. It's easy to be kind to kind people. I'm not blowing your minds with this one, but Jesus said it himself in the Gospel of Luke. He said, if you love those who love you, if you do good to those who do good to you, if you only lend to people who you know are going to pay you back, Jesus said, what good is that? He said, even sinners do that. But the very next verse, look what he says about biblical kindness. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will be acting as children of the Most High, for he is kind to those 
who are unthankful and wicked. We are most displaying the kindness of the Lord when our target audience is the unthankful and the wicked. Let's face it, that's different from the kindness of the world, isn't it? In this world, people are kind to kind people, and then when it starts to get contentious, then the claws come out, right? You've seen it just as much as I have. And it's important as Christians, it's important as those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, we have to get this right. We have to make sure that we are kind even when we're, when we're speaking the truth. Because there's the tendency, and I've seen it and you have too, there's the tendency sometimes when we talk to people who aren't followers of Jesus Christ to fade away into harshness. I think we start with kindness. We love people and we want people to experience what we've tasted. And so we start with kindness, but then we slowly start to trade kindness for harshness. We say things like, listen, I'm not being mean, I'm just being honest. And before we know it, we're in a contentious argument. In person, online, we start with kindness, and before we know it, we're telling people, they're wrong, and we're right, and they're going to hell. Church, kindness and truthfulness are not mutually exclusive. They are not on opposite ends of the spectrum. Make no mistake, we are called to preach the truth. We are called to share the good news. We have to. This world needs to know the love of Jesus. But we're never called to do it without kindness and love. Jesus says when we love our enemies, when we do good, when we lend without expecting anything in return, that's when we are acting as children of God because he is kind to the unthankful, the wicked, the harsh, the sinners, the ungrateful, the annoying, the Braves fans, all of those people in this world. <laughs> God's kind to all of them, and we should be too. God's kindness in your life is meant to bring his kindness to a world that desperately needs to know the love of Jesus. The way you are kind to other people may be the very thing that shows them the love of God. More than your testimony, more than the scripture you share on social media, more than the image that we portray, it may be your kindness that other people look at and say, what's different about you? What is it that you've experienced? What is it that you're on that allows you to be so kind to other people? When we're so overwhelmed with the kindness of the Lord, when we've tasted the kindness of the Lord, we should be sharing it with others. I read a story while researching this sermon about Augustine, who was a prominent theologian in the late 300s, early 400s. Some denominations refer to him as Saint Augustine. But his writings shaped the early church. The way Augustine studied scripture and wrote about scripture became part of the foundation for the modern Protestant faith. But there was a time early in his 20s, Augustine didn't have a faith at all. He didn't even believe in God. And many years later, in writing about his journey, he talked about a man named Bishop Ambrose, who he became friends with, started a conversation, and years later, look at what he wrote about Ambrose. That man of God received me like a father with a kindness most fitting of his ambition. Listen to this. I began to like him, not as a teacher of the truth, because I had no confidence in church, but simply as a human being who was kind to me. It was the kindness that captured the attention of this young man. That kindness turned into conversations. Those conversations turned into Bishop Ambrose sharing the gospel with Augustine. 
And that sharing of the gospel led to Augustine giving his life to Jesus and accepting him as his Savior and Lord. And that led to Ambrose baptizing him. And that led to Augustine studying scripture, writing about scripture, and then becoming one of the most prominent theological figures to shape the history of the church. And it all started with kindness. So as we wrap up today, there's a few questions I want you to consider. First, what is your source of kindness? Where is it that your kindness comes from in your life? Is it dependent on your mood? Or your job? Or the amount of money you have? Is it dependent on how much sleep you've gotten? Is it reactive to your circumstances? Or is it proactive because you've tasted the kindness of the Lord. Maybe today you just need to be kind and remind, ah, uh, you didn't forget, remind yourself of the kindness of God. Next, are you pursuing God more as a result of his kindness? When you understand how kind God is toward you, when you understand that he was kind even when we were the ungrateful and the wicked, does it make you hungry for more? Are you like a baby at a 2 a.m. feeding, screaming, I need more of this? Or are you like, no, nah, I'm good. I ate once for an hour on Sunday. I'm fine. I'll be good for the next six and a half days. <laughs> once you've tasted the kindness of the Lord, crave it more. Take steps to grow in your faith. And if you're there like, I would love that. I have no idea where to start. Fill out a connection card. Get in touch with us. We would love to help you. We're going to have chaplains on the side of the stage after the service who would love to pray for you and pray with you. But if you're craving more of the Lord and you don't know where to start, we would love to help you. Finally, are you actively growing in kindness? Are you proactively looking for opportunities to bring the kindness of God to this world? Or are you waiting for them to come to you? Is it one of those things where it's like, Lord, I'm going to stay back here. And if you put an opportunity in front of me and no one else helps and there's no other options and I'm your last resort, God, then I'll pray about it for a week. Or are you actively going through this life looking for opportunities to share the kindness of the Lord that you've got a taste of? Are you so overwhelmed with what you've tasted that you're like, this is incredible, I've got to share this with someone? Is there anything you've tasted that's like that? My 13-year-old, the dragon fruit refreshers from Dunkin' Donuts, he's going up to complete strangers going, have you tried this? <laughs> People I don't even know, he's like, have you ever tried this? You should get one, they're 1995. Or you can get the knockoff at Starbucks for $45. Um, when you've tasted how kind the Lord is, who are you sharing it with? I read a story last week scrolling through a sports page on social media. And it wasn't about biblical kindness per se. But I read the story and I was like, oh, that man has tasted the kindness of God. It was a story about a high school football game in Iowa in 2021 and it was two rival schools it was a really close game and in the fourth quarter one of the star players uh, his name was Carter Steinlich in the fourth quarter Carter went down screaming in pain it was a hot day he was severely dehydrated and he fell to the ground and started screaming and grabbing his leg and immediately a man named Mario Hofer came over and started tending to him he said, I saw that he was hurt, and I knew what needed to be done, and I did it. Here's the coolest part of the story. Mario wasn't a doctor. He wasn't a trainer. He wasn't a coach. He wasn't even a teammate. Check it out. Mario was the opponent. He could have easily been like, this is our chance to win. We're going to capitalize on this. Their star player is out. We're going to go for it. Heck, he could have even said, um, someone want to help this guy? Can we get a coach or a trainer or someone over here? He could have done either one of those, and it would have been pretty acceptable by the world's standards. 
Instead, instead, he ran over and helped someone. He was proactively kind to his opponent. Mario's gone, gone on to play college football. I went and checked out his bio page on the school's website. And in it, in the About Me section, he quotes his favorite Bible verses. That man has tasted the kindness of the Lord. So church, here's what I want to leave you with. As we go into a world that desperately needs to know that there is a heavenly father who wants to be kind, who wants to pour out his love and his grace and his mercy. Let's go out and be a church that is proactively kind. We are in a neighborhood, we're in an area, and we are called, God has called New Life to share the kindness of the Lord with Endicott, New York, and it's gonna take all of us to do it. So let's go be proactively kind. Let's start a conversation with someone where they're like, man, what, have, what are you on? Like, what have you tasted? What is it that you've got an intake that makes you so kind? And we can, sh and we can say to those people, we have tasted the kindness of the, of the Lord, and we would love to share it. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, I have tasted and seen your kindness. And I thank you so much that when I was the wicked and the unthankful, Lord, that you didn't turn away from me. So, Father, today as we just remind ourselves of the kindness of the Lord, I pray that that would overflow into the way that we go out to a broken world and show the love of Jesus. God, I pray, rather than praying that you would give us opportunities, Father, I pray that we would go out and proactively seek opportunities to share your kindness. And Father, as this church does it, would you bless these people? In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to see more content, click here, or this video was picked specifically for you. Thanks for stopping by. Don't forget to hit subscribe.